So hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. Uh, I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and today we're going to talk about uh, the, the vignettes from ARE 4.0. As you know, we, uh, Mike and, and our team here, put together a series of sample vignettes um, that we thought would, would really kind of help you understand, um, you know, take a swing at, at, uh, at completing some, and we'll use that as a basis for the conversation today. Before we get started, though, if you'd like to attend our next ARE live broadcast, which is going to be a really interesting one, we're going to we have a group uh, we're going to have a group discussion with some uh, recently licensed architects who are parents. We've had a lot of folks um, who've listened to that session and said, "Hey, you know, I'm a parent. Some of those things you've been telling me don't really apply. How the heck do you do this with a bunch of kids running yeah. around?" Um, so it should be a good one. The whole, okay, we're done, we can go get wasted now, doesn't quite <laughs> fit right. with the parent crowd. That's right. yeah. It's a little different. Um, so if you'd like to participate in that, you can go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. And then during the broadcast, of course, you'll have a chance to uh, participate in the discussion uh, with the group. So that should be uh, a really good one. A couple of updates to Black Spectacles products here around our exam prep, as you know, we have our video lectures, which are taught by Mr. Newman here. Um, we now also have online practice exams, online flashcards, and our group coaching program. Um, our February group coaching cohort just closed, I think, on Friday. Um, but if you're interested in participating in our next group coaching program, you can go to blackspectacles.com slash group coaching where you can add your name to our wait list for the next program. It's a really awesome program. What we do is we partner with recently licensed architects um, who are trained up to be uh, coaches. And then you're, uh, you're sort of um, put together with a group of six or seven um, candidates um, who are on the exact same path to licensure that you are. So in this case, it would be for ARE 5.0. It's for all six exams, um, and you sort of choose whether you want to take an exam um, every four weeks or every eight weeks. And then everyone's on the same pace, and you do some meetings virtually, and you get to be added to a Slack channel where you get to ask questions and stuff. It's really awesome. So um, if you're interested in that for next time, um, it's already available uh, where you can add your name to our wait list. Um, I also often like to remind folks that if you'd like your boss to pay for your Black Spectacles membership, be sure to tell them about our firm licenses for any size firm, whether you've got a 10-person firm or a 10,000-person firm, we have different licenses um, that can help. So just visit blackspectacles.com slash firms to learn more about that. And then as usual, today uh, at the end of our session, we'll have a special discount on uh, individual memberships uh, to share with you guys as well. My guest, um, as you, you probably know here, is Mr. Mike Newman. He's an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the founder of Shed Studio, and he's our instructor for Black Spectacles online ARE exam prep, um, if, which again, if you haven't already checked it out, it's awesome, blackspectacles.com. You can watch some of the videos for free. Today we'll be taking uh, questions using the GoToWebinar question box, which many of you have already found. Um, so I'll be manning that during our session, as well as on Twitter using the ARE Live podcast hashtag. Uh, but first, I'm going to hand it over to Mike. Okay. Uh, so yeah, um, here we are at the very end of 4.0, talking about the vignettes for 4.0. Uh, and I believe the reason for that is because we heard from a lot of folks that oh my God, I have to finish off this thing and uh, the vignettes are killing me. Uh, and so we thought, all right, we'll slide one in uh, before the, the final death knell of, uh, of 4.0. Uh, so uh, 5.0, uh, as most of you probably know already, doesn't have any vignettes. It has a couple of different kinds of drawing pro projects, but they're smaller and tighter. They're more like put a piece of flashing in here or arrange the uh, uh, um, insulation in this wall uh, here. Um, so it's relatively straightforward, simple ideas um, that uh, are a much smaller approach to the idea of a, of a drawing program. Uh, the vignettes are uh, kind of came about in 3 and 3.1 um, as a way to kind of uh, fill the gap that people felt was needed when uh, the 
whole project jumped over into the uh, computer project here. Um, it wasn't that long ago, about 20 years ago or so, that um, everything was done in pen and uh, paper, pencil and paper, and there was a whole drawing project. You had to actually draw a building, you had to draw floor plans and elevations and site plans and wall section and a bunch of stuff uh, to sort of say, yes, I can put together a building in 12 hours, um, which I am happy to say I was able to do. Um, and it was quite the experience. It was uh, an intense, you know, kind of amazing thing. And then when they jumped to the computer programs, they came up with these sort of ways of trying to get at the same sets of issues, but using these, these programs. And nobody has ever really liked the vignettes. The vignettes are uh, this sort of vestigial, leftover way of approaching this. Um, and it's just never quite been reasonable. However, you can get good at them. So the fact that they are sort of awkward and not really drawing and not really uh, uh, sort of a typical part of a normal exam, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can figure it out. You can crack the code and kind of get good at how to put together these vignettes uh, and uh, just sort of think of them as their own thing. It's not really like drawing a building like we did back when it was pen and paper. Uh, and it's not really like putting together something on a, you know, using Revit or AutoCAD or anything like that. It's its own thing. And we'll talk more about that uh, in a second. So the vignettes are a very weird sort of little category here. And what we did is we sent out a few, uh, uh, three different uh, sort of quick takes on a couple of these different uh, vignettes uh, to, so you could sort of take a chance and take a look at them and then we'll run through those right now and then talk sort of generally about it as we go along. So I'm just gonna start to jump right in here. Uh, and hang on a second. There we go. All right, so first thing I wanna say uh, is um, the vignettes are about architectural topics. Uh, they are architecturally related. They are uh, next door to architecture. They are not, however, architecture. Uh, no drawing you will do in any of the vignettes will actually look like any real architectural drawing you would do in your office. Uh, they are, that's really sort of not what they're trying to get across. Uh, one key thing to take away is that there are these sort of I ideas and issues that they want you to be able to both understand and demonstrate that you understand, and that's going to be the main thing about what we're talking about today. But the other thing is, and this is a little part of the ridiculousness, which is why they're finally getting rid of these vignettes, uh, is that you also just need to know how to use the program. So uh, you should spend some time and go get the program. Uh, you can get onto NCARB. You can actually get to them from the Black Spectacles site. You can get to them from NCARB site. Uh, and you uh, sort of create, make your computer into like a little terminal. Uh, and you uh, download the interface. And there you sort of can take off and just test it out. Um, it is partly about the architectural concepts that we're talking about, but it is also at least 50% you being familiar and comfortable with the program itself. So we're not really going to focus too much on that right now. That's something you have to kind of do on your own just to kind of get used to it and used to how you use the uh, toolbars and what kinds of systems there are. We'll mention it a little bit as we go along, but it is one of those things you have to get kind of used to. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, these are not, as I said, they're not architecture. Uh, so I'm so much so I'm going to write down not architecture. Uh, so just so you kind of hammer that home, it's not even drawing. So it's not drawing. Like, what do I mean by that? Like, is, well, it's not that you have a toolbar that's going to give you a line tool that you can then make some lines that will then become like walls. 
it's not even like Revit where you can say, all right, I'm going to grab a wall tool and I'm going to make some walls and that will become like a building. It's actually, I'm going to be grabbing rooms or uh, a chair or uh, a, and a, a number of joists and I'm going to put them all in at once. Right? It's this very abstracted way of thinking about drawing. So don't think of it as a drawing. Don't think of it as architecture. And it's not really even reasonable. Um, it's really, uh, there are very specific things it's looking for. It's not trying to make a sort of a reasonable argument about what a building should look like. Uh, so it's just not a reasonable process. Uh, so don't expect it to be, and don't fret about that. Don't worry about it. Don't make a big deal out of the fact that what you're being asked to do is kind of crazy. Uh, just accept it and move on because that's the whole thing here is these things are puzzles. They are architectural puzzles. So when you think of it in that way, it should make a lot more sense. Uh, this is a situation where there's going to be a bunch of information, a bunch of rules given to you. You have to figure out how to follow those rules. You're going to remember some information. You're going to jot down other information. You're going to bring one thing from one place and put it in another. You're going to make a nice little pattern out of these things. And that pattern will be sort of architecturally intended, but it is not architecture. It is an architecturally related puzzle. So that's the key thing. If you can take anything away from this discussion, that's the key thing. One of the things that people have trouble with all the time when they start doing these vignettes is they try to make them architecture. They start thinking about design. They start thinking about making something beautiful or uh, what would be the most efficient. And for the most part, we don't care about any of that. That's just not what's being tested here. And you're wasting your time if you are, and actually quite likely going to do something that will make you fail. You want to do just enough to show competency in being able to organize the puzzle into a reasonable answer in the type of answer that they are looking for. Not the right kind of answer, not the best architecture, not something that's beautiful, but what's the kind of answer for this puzzle that they are looking for? That's how you should be approaching it. What do they want to see? Uh, so, okay, uh, we did uh, three sample uh, vignettes, uh, one section, one structure, and one topography. Uh, they're relatively s uh, simple ones. Uh, we wanted to make it fairly easy to talk about. Um, and the reason that we chose those is that uh, the section, the point of what we're going to be talking about for the section is that uh, we want you to sort of get used to the idea that they're going to be asking you a question that seems very straightforward, but then you realize you have to search somewhere else for more information. Uh, so that's kind of the main thing that we'll talk about with the section, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, with the structure vignette, uh, the main thing about that one is going to be the fact that we're going to be talking about it in 2D, but you have to be thinking about it in 3D. Uh, and there's a couple of those, the roof, the stair, the section, uh, excuse me, the structure vignette. It's a bunch of those where you're drawing it in 2D, but you have to think of it in 3D, and there's no place for you to uh, get 3D information. You just have to kind of build it in your brain while you're doing uh, the vignette. And then the third one, the topography, um, uh, this is one where we're going to talk about a little bit. For the most part, you only do what you're asked. Don't go above and beyond. Just do the things that you are asked to do. However, there are certain kinds of topics that you are expected to bring to the table. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about on the topography one as sort of an example. So let's just sort of uh, jump in and start, uh, start seeing what we got here. So the first one we're going to talk about is the section. So here's the, the write-up for the section. And these are sort of a little bit simplified. This is just us making a sort of simpler version in order for you to be able to have this conversation. Uh, the actual version is a little bit more detailed, a little bit more convoluted with a couple more <laughs> issues in it. All right, uh, the following drawing shows the first floor plan, including the framing members for the second floor. 
So it's the plan of the first floor, but the framing for the floor above of Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. It is a two-story building, but in the interest of time, we will just focus on the first floor. Uh, on the actual exam, you'll actually be looking at both floors. This is just to keep it simple. Note the following. First floor is slab on grade. Frost depth is 48 inches. Ceilings are nine foot generally. Laboratory is a double height space open to above, you know, because you have to be able to get the lightning from above to be able to get the whole thing to work, so it's mm -hmm. open to above. Uh, but for our purposes, it's a double height space. The reception area has a 10 foot ceiling. Assume 10 inches for lighting and sprinkler piping. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, any duct smaller than a 12 by 12 can fit between joists. Uh, all others must run below the joist. So essentially, all the ducts are running below the joist uh, with the occasional little end pieces uh, running up between them. And then draw the section. Uh, in this case, like I said, we're only going to deal with the first floor. But draw the section uh, of the first floor at the cut line shown. So one of the things we should find quickly is where that cut line is. Uh, and include the floor-to-floor -floor dimensions, the overall floor-to-floor -floor heights. Uh, so let's take a look at what we're talking about here. So here's our floor plan. So this is the first floor plan. Uh, we've got uh, the reception area up here. So this must be the front door coming in. Uh, we've got a corridor that's running uh, through here called the rated corridor. Uh, straight off from the reception is uh, Igor or Igor, I can't remember. <laughs> Igor's <laughs> office. Igor. Igor's office. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Frankenstein's uh, office is uh, back uh, behind, so Igor is his uh, sort of assistant. Uh, down the way a little bit here, we've got a medical library and we've got the evil plans office. Uh, and then the big room here is Frankenstein's laboratory. Now, uh, I can't guess, obviously this is a little ridiculous. Uh, uh, I'd be very surprised if they gave you Frankenstein's laboratory. Um, however, uh, I can guarantee you it's going to be a two-story building with one big room that is a double height space of some sort uh, and uh, that there'll be rooms that wrap around it. it you know, maybe it's a, a part of a school and it's a little gymnasium with some classrooms wrapping around it or maybe it's a library with a uh, reading room and then some spaces around it, or it's a showroom space with uh, some office spaces around it, something like that. It's going to be something very similar to this. Uh, so uh, while this is sort of absurd, um, it's actually pretty similar to what's really going on. And then there's some other information here. We have uh, these lines going, showing us the structure. Uh, so we can look around and find, in this case, it's a 28 inch open web steel joists uh, at uh, six feet on center. Um, and then we've got some other structure over here, 18 inch open web uh, joists at 24 inches uh, on center. Uh, and uh, we had read previously that there was a four inch um, uh, corrugated deck uh, with a concrete fill uh, on the previous page. So we would add that onto those. And then we also note that there's some, uh, these darker lines are showing the uh, path of the um, ductwork. Uh, for some reason that's not connected there. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, and that uh, ductwork uh, is uh, going to tell us, uh, we have some sizes on there, and so we have to make sure that we accommodate uh, the ductwork as we uh, uh, do our, our section cut. So here's the section cut. Uh, it's a little tight there, but you can see that's the section line running right through, and then we're looking that direction. So uh, we can start thinking about this. The first thing we have to come up with is what is our floor to floor so that we can uh, draw in uh, draw our section overall. So first thing we need to note is if we kind of went back and looked, we would find out that all of these rooms uh, and the corridor all have a nine foot ceiling. So I'm gonna put a nine foot ceiling here, ceiling height. Uh, and then it also mentioned that it's gonna leave 10 inches for lighting and for sprinkler pipes. So if you think about it, 
if you imagine we have a room and you've got somebody sitting in that room, sitting at a table or something, uh, there's probably some light fixtures up above the, the ceiling in this sort of commercial kind of setting. Uh, there's probably some pipes running around that then come down and have little uh, spray nozzles on them for the sprinkler heads. Uh, but if somebody was going to change something, if you know, we decided to take one wall down and move it around a little bit or shift some desks around, these light fixtures might actually move around. They may get switched around in different locations. And so the flexibility that's required for that uh, means that uh, we want to be able to have just a few um, uh, things in that sort of first section of area just above the ceiling. So you don't want any duct work there. You don't want any of the uh, structure there. You want to keep it as clear and open as possible so that if you need to readjust those lights, you can. So there's a logical place where they end up getting put, but essentially we're leaving that 10 inch space right there uh, so we've got the nine foot down below and we leave that 10 inch space uh, in order to be able to move those light fixtures and sprinkler heads around as necessary. So uh, I'm going to add uh, 10 inches to that. Uh, and then the next thing we're going to have is we're going to have some duct work here somewhere. So there's going to be some big duct that's got to be able to get around. And then above that, there's going to be our structure. So we've got the nine foot ceiling, we've got the 10 inch space for the light fixtures and for the sprinkler. Uh, and then we have to figure out what our uh, duct size is and we have to figure out what our uh, structure size is. So let's talk about this zone right here of our section cut. The structure we know is the 28 inches plus the four inch deck. So that's 32 inches. And then the question left is, how big is the duct that we need to be able to accommodate? So we look here, our section cut goes right across there. And there's our 12 by 20 supply duct. So we can do that. Obviously, you can always use the shorter number. So that would make that a 12 inch. Is that right? That is not right. How Why do not, I know Mike? that's <laughs> not right? Well, because that happens to be what it is right where I do the section cut, but that's not the biggest duct that has to be accommodated. You wouldn't want to have the floor change heights or the ceiling change heights or anything. So you have to just set the ceiling height and then set the floor height, which means you have to be able to accommodate the biggest duct that you're going to have. So um, get rid of that so we can put a new number in. Uh, let's scan around and find. There's a 10. That's too small. That's just even smaller. Those are all 10s. Uh, I got anything. Oh, oh, how about right there? I got a 24 by 30 and a 24 by 24, which means this is 24 inches. Nice job, Paul H. Paul. Way to go. Threw that in there. Um, so our total floor to floor is going to add all of those up, which when we do so is going to be uh, sort of equal to 14.6, I believe. Feel free to check that. Uh, so our total floor to floor is 14.6. Now, here's an interesting thing. We have one little sort of question mark spot here, though, which is the reception area because the reception area is exactly the same, except it has a 10-foot ceiling, has the same 10-inch area for the lighting and for the uh, sprinklers. But now let's take a look in this zone. It's only one little area. We don't really have to accommodate all of this other ductwork, which is in a different ceiling heighted area. It's a different set of relationships. It really only has to accommodate the biggest one in its own area, which in this case is 14 inches. So we've got a one, two, one foot two here. And then its own structure, which is 18 inches plus the four inches for the slab. Uh, so we're at uh, 22 inches, which is 110. So we add all of that up 
And this ends up being, I believe, 1310, which is less than the 146, so the 146 drives it. So our floor to floor is 146. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Uh, what you're looking for is what is the combination of ceiling height? Uh, everybody's going to have the same space for uh, uh, lighting and, and sprinkler. Um, it, you should check it. It might be 11 inches, it might be 8 inches, could be a couple different numbers. 10 is the typical. Um, uh, but everybody's going to have that same thing anywhere in the, in the building. Uh, but the combination of ceiling height, uh, duct that has to be accommodated for, and then total structure, that's the, you're looking for the driving one that's going to establish the height of that second floor floor. And then if we were doing the full on thing, we'd be doing exactly the same thing again, looking for trying to establish the roof height as well. So it would be the same thing again. We would just be adding up all those same uh, numbers and finding which one is the driving number. I have a number of questions here about the orientation of the duct. Yeah. Uh, so some folks maybe aren't comfortable with the idea that the 24 by 30, that you're not taking, like why aren't you taking the 30 inch height, right? Why are you assuming that it's the 24, the shorter height? That's a very good question. And the answer is because I want to. Um, if you think about it, like why would I ever make it harder on myself? Uh, so the, th the, there is no reason to make it 30 inches tall. The only thing that's going to do is make my building taller um, and cost money. Now, there are plenty of examples that we can all imagine. We just don't have enough room left to right to be able to fit in the 30 inches, so it has to go the other direction, or uh, there's a uh, some other reason, like maybe there's a bigger duct somewhere else that it doesn't really matter whether the 30 inch is the driving one uh, because there's a 46 inch one somewhere. Uh, so we can do the 30 inch tall if we want. Well, that's fine, but you would never accidentally choose to make it taller uh, unless there was a good reason to do. Um, there is no efficiency difference 24 by 30 versus 30 by 24. Uh, they're, bo they're both relatively efficient. Obviously the most efficient is gonna be a square or a circle because it gives me less friction per uh, perimeter area. Um, but uh, you know, this uh, 24 by 30 is reasonably efficient. One of the things you'll find often in these kinds of buildings is instead of it being 24 by 30, it's more like you know, 15 by 42 or something like that, where you, you make it as pancakey as possible in order to just not have that ceiling come barreling down on top of everybody. So you're trying to make it as thin as possible. But as soon as you start making something that thin, it becomes way less efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're, you're not getting the same kind of flow and all of that. So generally, you're trying to be, well, not square, a little bit less than square, save a little bit of height, uh, and you're always going to choose the smaller dimension unless there's a reason. And in this vignette, they're never going to make it that complicated that they're going to give you a reason. Right. That would be way too hard yeah. to, to, how would they even write it? It would be too complicated. Like, they're just not going to do that. So just always choose the smaller number. But the smaller number is likely to be something like 24 or 36 or 30, or because they're going to want you to realize, oh, wow, that's a big duck that has to be fit in. And it's, I can almost guarantee you it will not be what's right at where your section cut is. Yeah, I feel like that's, that's the gotcha that they're going to do. Is, that's, is they're, they're testing whether or not you're, you know to look at all the different duct heights and all the different by structural by far the situations. biggest thing that they're looking for yeah. in this. Yeah. So they're not going to quiz you on the intricacies of efficiency of a duct. Right. Right, um, the, the fact that I just said that a 15 by 48 or something is going to be much less efficient than a 20, like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. way beyond yeah, what yeah. this vignette is right. about. Uh, one other thing I'm noticing here, you drew a section and then you kind of added up and then you also drew all the different heights and you sort of added them up. Um, is that something you would recommend? Is, is that something you're doing for this podcast that's weird? Or is this a very good practice for sitting in the testing center? I would absolutely do exactly what I just did. Um, I might do it a little better than I just did it, <laughs> but um, like maybe 
actually draw it right in here. So let's say nine foot there, and then uh, was it 24 here, uh, and then 32 there. Um, so that you can see it very simply and easily. You want to, uh, on all of the, these things, you want to find a way to make sure that your quick thinking is graphically helping you to choose the right answers. Uh, so the fact that, uh, you know, I put a little scale person in, it means that if I'm coming back 15 minutes later, I can't forget what I was drawing there. I can't get confused by what's the room and what's the duct or something like that. Make it as simple and fast as you can, but make it clear and simple uh, and write it out as you go along. It'll make life much, much easier, especially when you find some other piece of information. Let's say we kept looking and we found another duct that we hadn't noticed earlier, because it can be a little complicated. You can, you know, ducts can sort of slide in in unusual locations. And so you want to be able to come back very easily and say, oh no, it turns out it's actually 36. I'm going to cross that out, put 36. I now can exactly see my thought process, how I found the problem, where the problem got fixed, and therefore when I add it up, I can see that my number adding up is actually, uh, you know, it, it's, it's all following through and I can see it. So absolutely. Remember that when you go into these things, um, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to strip you down naked so you uh, just walk in with no clothes and nothing else. I'm slightly exaggerating for those of you who have taken one of these things already. Um, you know, they don't let you even bring your coat in in most situations. I, I'm, I think most of the time you have to leave your coat outside. Uh, and you certainly can't bring in any phones or anything like that. Uh, they don't even want you to use uh, your own pens and things. They give you a pencil and I think it's three sheets of paper. Um, and maybe that depends on which uh, vignette it is. Uh, but you get like a sheet of paper and a pencil, uh, and that's what you've got. So, you know, do, do this on your sheet of page, paper uh, with your pencil and just keep track of things. And you can see that I did the one uh, over here on this side because that's referring to this zone. Uh, and I did the other one over here on this side because that's referring to that zone. And so I'm graphically making it easier for myself to follow down the road. And then um, this is obviously a little bit of a hot button topic here. Um, a couple of folks are saying like, well, can I, you know, how about if I just add a few inches here to round this off or, or you know, X, Y, and Z. It just, yeah. th this is one of those things that's like, there's a very clear answer. It's this plus this plus this plus this and that's it. There's yeah. no... Right, yeah, and, and you don't need to do that. No. Um, and that, that's part of what the 10 inches is for. Uh, the 10 inches, you know, the light fixtures themselves will be four inches, and uh, the pipe the, for the sprinkler is, you know, it's a couple more inches uh, just above that. So, uh, you know, you can fit that in probably in six or six and a half or seven inches. So giving it 10 inches, that's really your factor of safety right there. So you don't need to do anything beyond that. And the 10 inches actually is going to come from uh, the program, like it, it'll be part of the, uh, the program itself. It'll say, and leave 10 inches. It might say a different number. Like I said, it could say eight inches, it could say 11 or 12 inches. Uh, different, you know, if things are highly flexible, you might make it more just to make it easier. Uh, if you think things are gonna stay the same for a very long time, you might tighten it up a little bit to just save some height. Um, but they're probably going to say 9, 10, something like that, and just give you that number, and that's where all that flexibility is. Don't overthink it. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. So um, what we've got here is we've got uh, the reception room in our section, we've got the corridor, then we've got uh, Igor's office, and then Frankenstein's office. Uh, so let's uh, do a quick draw up of what this looks like. All right, so this is going to be a very bad drawing. My apologies. Okay. So there's the reception. Here's the corridor. Okay. 
There's Igor's office. And there's Frankenstein's office. Uh, all right, so what do we know uh, about all this? Well, for one, we know that this is all slab on grade. So I'm going to put the slab down. Um, remember that the tools are not lines. They're not, you're not drawing these things. You're grabbing something that says slab, and then you're placing the slab in place. Uh, so uh, it's not as sort of, it's not like you're drawing from scratch. Um, then uh, we have, uh, I'm, for our purposes, I'm going to just put a little line across here. You, this is not something that you would actually draw, but just to show that 10 inch zone. So that's something that we're just showing here for our purposes, but not, it's not actually shown on that. You just show the ceiling. Uh, and then I've got uh, the duct. It doesn't really matter uh, to get it exactly right. You just sort of get reasonably close to what the size is of the cut, not leaving enough space for the biggest one, uh, but you would want to draw in what's actually at the cut. And then uh, you may have remembered that this is actually a structural line, and so our joists are running here. While Mike is writing that, just as a reminder, um, NCARB offers software, and we've gotten a couple more comments. They offer this practice exam software for you, so make sure that you download it or you get access to it and that you practice. Because it is all vignettes. about being good at the program. I had a question about, you know, do they have a certain type of calculator um, in the software? The answer is make sure you go practice this so that you can find out exactly what tools you'll get. Yeah. And each one of them has like a practice um, problem as well. So you should definitely do that practice problem. It'll give you a good feel for solving one of them. Well, not only, not only is it a useful thing to do that, but it actually will give you a chance to not only practice using the software, but it'll give you a chance to practice how you're going to approach the project. Because each of these you want to you want to know, what, as soon as you turn the button on for the computer, you want to be able to just start racing through it. Um, so, okay, this is the basics of it. Um, we've got uh, our ceiling height at 10 foot uh, over here at reception and nine foot everywhere else. We've got that same uh, 10 inch space there. We've got a duct in here somewhere. I'm actually drawing it as if we're cutting it that way. It's not really there, but um, so there's the basic section. And now there's some other stuff that we have to think about. So for one, this is a structural line coming down. This is a structural line, and this is a structural line. So each of those need to have footings. So we're gonna go down, and this is a again a tool. And I'm getting down, the reason I'm drawing it down there is because I'm below the frost depth, which I believe was 48 inches. And then I need this one as well. Do I do that down here? And the answer is no, because I don't need to get to the frost depth in the middle of the building. If I did need to do that, that means that the whole building is already frozen and all hell's broken loose and it's too late. Um, so we don't do that, but we would put the footing right there directly below. So then uh, the only other couple things left to think about would be uh, what do we know, what's the difference between this partition and this partition? Uh, well, this one is for the corridor. You'll note that this one, because it was a structural change, had to go all the way up to the underside of the deck. Uh, but this one, because it's part of the rated corridor, also has to go all the way up to the underside of the deck above. So this is a rated corridor. So that wall continues all the way up. Oop, sorry about that. Tricky little device here. This is also a rated uh, part of that corridor, so that also goes up, and it's also bearing wall, so it does anyway. Igor's office is not rated separately from Frankenstein's office. 
Uh, I'm just going to call it francs. So this one actually only needs to just go just above the ceiling and it doesn't need to go up to the underside of the deck because that's just a regular partition. This one that's part of the corridor is a rated wall, so it has to go all the way up. So that's pretty much it. And then we do the same thing up here on the second floor with a whole bunch of different numbers. Uh, there'll be a few complications like uh, double height spaces. You, you might have to do the section through the double height space, at which point you might have windows above something, below this, above that. So it can get a little funny, but that's the process, right? You figure out what's the driving force, lay those numbers down so I get what my overall floor to floor height is. Uh, that means I can set that height, I can set the ceiling height, I can now start putting in all those other partitions, I can put in the structure, I can make sure everything meets it, I can do a little checklist because I will have practiced this a couple times and I'll check, all right, I've got frost depth, I've got not frost depth. Quite literally, you can fail this vignette if you put that middle one at frost depth because it'll seem like you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and then I check to make sure that their fire ratings are all in the right spot. Uh, I check to make sure that the ducts are in the appropriate locations uh, and that all the numbers add up. I go back and check all my numbers again and there you go. I'm all done. Uh, footing to the top or the bottom for frost depth? depth. Uh, so I've been this, dying to ask this question too. So I, I really <laughs> This is one of those answer. sort of funny things. So if it says uh, 48 inches, then technically that is 48 inches. Now, one of the things that people do all the time here uh, is they just add their own little factor of safety in and they instead take the 48 to there if you will. Um, and so that means that this whole thing is just a factor of safety down beyond. But the frost depth is referring to specifically the bottom of the footing. Um, so in the real world, I often do it the other way, but there's no need to on the exam. Um, and the reason I do it the other way in the real world is because, you know, I've been out on job sites and you know, things that are supposed to be at a certain level, maybe there was some stiffer soil there and they just didn't quite dig it down and so it's six inches higher than it was. Like, there's all kinds of things that they do and that's fine, uh, you know, it's sort of, it's the life of the project. Um, you just don't want a, you know, inspector coming along and measuring it and suddenly it's wrong and you're pulling things out. And so I just add it in as a factor of safety usually, personally, but that's not, necessary for this. Okay. It's a good question. All right, can I move on? Yeah. All right, next project. This is the structural uh, uh, layout. The Werewolf Community Theater, you may have noticed the theme, uh, is building a small community center and stage space for the nighttime productions. Uh, the space is a simple structural concept, one tall multi-purpose space with two smaller side spaces on two of the sides to support, to support the productions. On the following floor plans, uh, sketch the required structural framing plan using masonry bearing walls, beams, columns, joists, and structural decking. The maximum deck span is five feet. The maximum joist span is 30 feet. The maximum beam span is 45 feet. Uh, doors need a steel lintel when part of a masonry bearing wall. Columns can be put into any existing wall or window wall. You may not add new walls. Okay, so note uh, down here, uh, any wall on the framing plan can be either a masonry bearing wall or a beam column frame. It's your choice depending on what you think makes the most sense for that portion of the building. And it can be mixed. You can have part of the building be masonry and part of the building be a steel beam column frame. Um, you know, most masonry buildings are going to be some combination. Uh, but do not overstructure the building. Try to keep it economical and simple. Uh, so that means things like if it says that the maximum deck span is five feet, like it does right here, um, that means the joists should be five feet apart from each other. You know, just because uh, it's a um, 
uh, you know, you're, you're trying to be extra careful. You don't want to suddenly make those things three feet apart from each other just to show that you're smart and careful. If it tells you that the max is five, do it at the max, keep it nice and economical. It's one of the things that the structural layout is looking for you to know is that it should be a simple and straightforward and economical process. So I, I gave you a little 3D look here um, and we're kind of cheating with this uh, because this is kind of the whole game of this one is that what you're going to see, I'm gonna jump forward here for a second, are two plans. So there's the lower level plan. So here we have the main multi-purpose space a little stage area, a little back of house zone, and then a concessions area, an entrance in, a second egress out, window wall over here. And then if we look at the upper level, well, we can see the roof and the roof. Then we see the space uh, below, which is that multi-purpose space. So it's just a one-story building, but we see is these two different floor areas. Um, so we will be seeing it on the vignette as f straightforward floor plans. Reason I showed it this way is I wanted you to start thinking about it as 3D because quite literally 60% of this exam, uh, of this vignette is do you realize that if you have a beam here, let's say, and a st joist structure there, and a joist structure here, that I need another beam right there. So in plan, if I'm looking straight down, this beam and this beam are right on top of each other. So if when you read this and then you look at that set of floor plans, you should realize that there are two sets of structure, one for each different height of the roof. Now, like I said, this is not a real building. It doesn't even show any slope in the roof. It doesn't show any, all sorts of other things that you would normally be thinking about for this kind of thing. That's not what it's about. It's really just trying to get at, if you see something like this, can you picture it in 3D and understand that there needs to be multiple levels of structure? So, uh, am I going to use bearing walls or am I going to use uh, beam and column? Well, n I can use anything I want, but like I'm probably not going to use bearing walls in a situation where I'm going to have big openings. So I probably don't want to put a bearing wall in this wall. I probably don't where the stage open is. I'm probably not going to put a bearing wall. That just doesn't make any sense. I'm going to have a bearing wall with this big opening in it. It doesn't, doesn't follow. Um, uh, and then this wall, I probably don't want to use as a bearing wall because first of all, it's got this big opening right here, but it also has this big uh, clear story opening up above it. So, do I want to put bearing walls in? Sure, I can put bearing walls. Why don't I make this a bearing wall? And maybe I make this a bearing wall because it's pretty straightforward. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about this one in a minute. So because I have a bearing wall with a door, it means I have to show that there's a lintel there. Uh, this one, there's no uh, uh, doors or openings in it, so that one's okay. Um, and now we're gonna start thinking about how the roof structure is going to work. So I'm gonna show the upper roof structure on the upper plan and the two lower roof structures on this lower plan and I'm going to just say, all right, I've got a joist here, and then every five feet, I'm just kind of uh, roughing it here. And then I've got one at the end. Uh, and I'm going to say that these have to be held up on a beam. So there's a column there, and there's a column there. Uh, and if we take a look at the spans, we might decide to break up that overall span, so I might make that two different beams. Um, I probably don't need to make it three. That would probably be more than, I, than necessary. Um, I've got the bearing wall over here. I've got the beam and column over here. I've got the joists, and then if the joists are running this direction, that means the decking is running that direction. 
So the decking is spanning, going perpendicular across uh, those joists. The joists are spanning, in this case, from bearing wall to beam. The beam is spanning from column to column and column to column. So everything is structured there. So now I could either do the same direction here and make this a bearing wall, or I could turn the direction the other way and make this a bearing wall. Uh, it's really sort of up to us um, what do we feel like doing here. How about, uh, why don't we, let's turn it. So there's a joist, there's another joist, another joist, another joist. And then I'm going to put a column and a column and a beam and a beam. And I'm going to make this a bearing wall. So I've now got this structured. Now this particular one has to have the decking go the other direction because it has to span across those joists. All right, and then there's going to be a beam there. So now I get up to this upper level uh, and I can go any direction that I want. Um, so I have a beam here, I have a beam here, um, excuse me, a column there and a column there. Um, so I could take this uh, uh, right there, that moment right there, I'm going to put it in right there spot right there and right there and I can put a beam in right across there put a column in and then I could run the joists that way that's totally reasonable let's think about it the other way as well I could also have this uh, run across there and then have the joists run this way. The reason that I'm putting that beam in at all is because if I start looking at this number, I'm going to be very clearly either direction I go here, I'm going to be longer than the 30 foot maximum for uh, the uh, joist span. So I need to break it up somehow. So I'm putting a beam across in this case. Uh, that won't necessarily be the case for your project, but uh, this you can see why I would have to do that. Let's just do it that way. And then here I've got the bearing wall and I'm picking up that beam on that bearing wall. And then I've got the joists spanning on either side. What do those joists bear into? Well, they bear into this beam right here. So, Everything is structured. Uh, the decking is going that way. Uh, we've got this roof structured and this roof structured, and we've got the main roof structured. Uh, we've got bearing walls only in locations where they're meaningful. Uh, in this case, I probably could have gotten away with not making this a bearing wall and just putting a column there and then making sure that that column showed up on the lower level. That probably would have been smarter, but uh, you know, just trying to show a couple different ways of approaching it. Um, so we have all of these things going, and like I said, half of the point of all of this is just so that you see that there is a beam right there that's at the height of this lower roof. And there's a beam right in that exact same location that's at the height of the upper roof. So there's one right on top of the other, which is why we have to show a lower level and an upper level. And that is what they're looking to make sure uh, that you have picked up. Um, so then you just got to go through and make sure, all right, if I showed a column up here, it better make sense going all the way through, uh, or it's sitting on top of a bearing wall. Uh, everything sort of follows through. I, uh, the decking reaches to all of the uh, joists. The joists reach 
from beam to beam or to a bearing wall. The beams reach from column to column or to a bearing wall. Uh, the columns run all the way through from the upper all the way down to the lower, and there you go. So again, the point of this one is just to be able to look at something that's 2D and think of it in 3D. All right, let's look at number three here. On the topography plan shown, you will be adding the picnic table uh, patio for the visitors to Dracula's castle. After the visitors have had their blood sucked, they will need to be wheeled in wheelchairs back to their cars, because you get very weak. Uh, therefore, the walkway needs to be accessible. Alter the contour lines to create better stormwater runoff pattern that will not impact the picnic area. Create a construction pad for the picnic area, the dashed rectangle that's going to be shown, uh, and create that accessible path. Uh, do not disturb uh, the existing parking lot or the existing trees. Uh, what is the proposed elevation of the picnic area? So a couple of quick thoughts here. One is the word or phrase construction pad. Uh, most of us, when we see the word pad, think of a concrete pad. Um, but actually, uh, concrete pads are sort of a, a different thing. Uh, that's a specific uh, and a very level sort of set of construction. A construction pad is what you do to a site in order to get ready to put the concrete in or to get ready to do the project. So construction pad actually slopes a little bit because you never know. You might do it, you might do that first part, and then maybe you get bad weather for two months or something, and it has to sit there and it should drain away. You don't want it to pond. So it'll actually have a little tiny bit of slope just to keep it uh, sort of draining reasonably well itself and kind of being uh, yeah, careful about it. So the construction pad is one thing. It's different from a concrete pad. Don't get them confused. They, I think, will almost always, on this vignette, talk about them as a construction pad. So you have a couple different things you need to do. One is you need to deal with the stormwater. One is you need to uh, create an accessible path. Uh, and the other is you need to make a, uh, the construction pad uh, on the site. So let's take a look at the site. So here's the tree zones on either side. Uh, if we look at the numbers, you always look at the numbers. Don't just assume you know which way is up. This is 71, 70, 69, 68. So this is clearly the high zone is over here. Uh, and the low zone is over there. Here's the existing parking lot. This presumably is the walkway uh, that needs to be accessible, uh, and that's where that pad needs to go. Uh, so first things first, we look at this accessible uh, walkway. We might have some issues there. What's going to be the big question there? Well, uh, these uh, contours are one foot apart. Uh, we need to be uh, at least 20 feet apart from each other that distance right there. Each of these contours needs to be 20 feet apart from each other. Why? Uh, so that if we're 20 or more feet apart, that means we are one foot vertical for 20 feet horizontal, which means it is an accessible path that doesn't require any railings or anything like that. We could do it as close as 12 feet, but then everything would have to have railings and curbs and all of that. Um, so generally, in this kind of situation, we just want to make sure that each of these is at least 20 feet apart from each other. So we'll come back and we'll think about that in just a minute. Then we have uh, this uh, picnic zone here uh, that we want to make a sort of construction pad for. So that means that we're going to do something like uh, have this So what we've just done, by altering this contour line, we've made this, that that whole thing can fit in that area. It's still slightly sloped because we're going down the 12 inches, but we now have an area where we could put in the concrete slab later uh, during the construction process, and that'll make logical sense. So there's one and two, and then the other thing is we've got uh, an uphill, which means I've got rain coming down this hill. That storm water is going to come down and it's going to come right at our picnic area. <coughs> uh, 
<coughs> sorry, I'm running a little cold here, which is why I'm especially sexy sounding today. <laughs> uh, so if I lose my voice here, apologies. Um, all right, so we've got one issue here, which is trying to make sure that our accessible spacing makes sense. So that we're trying to get uh, you know 20 foot spacing at the at the steepest. We've got the pad which we just did, and we've got to worry about the storm water flowing down the hill right onto our uh, pad. We want to stop that from happening. So we want to be able to bring that that storm water and just take it right around. That's what we want to be able to do, right? We want to be able to take that storm water and go right around and skip by our area. All right, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to go to this open site for just a second here, and we're going to draw here. So here's our pad, and we've got a bunch of uh, lines around. We're trying to pick up that water, any water that's coming, and take it right around. So what that's going to end up looking like is something like that. I swear, I always thought these diagrams looked like something out of an alien movie. <laughs> yeah. And at some point, we can kind of just stop. So if your rainwater coming down here you're going to come down and you're going to get caught in one of these, either this one or this one, of these swales, these ditches that we're going to make that go right around it. And then we also made that nice big flat area right there for that uh, overall uh, concrete or construction pad. So let's go back and just do it real quick right in here. Uh, so let's do something like this. Okay. It's so relaxing watching you draw. <laughs> so we definitely have more than 20 feet there. We've got more than 20 feet there, more than 20 feet there, and clearly more than 20 feet there up to there. So our pathway is easily accessible. Definitely more than 20 feet between each contour, probably more like 24, 25, 26 feet, something like that, which is going to be a nice, easy slope for that uh, uh, person who's passed out in the wheelchair because of the <laughs> blood sucking. Um, so that now works. One little sort of side note, um, because it's sort of small here, I'm just sort of showing it cutting right across. Um, but uh, in fact, you would always make sure that if I have a path um, that as it comes across, you always want it to do something like that so that the water drains off to the side. You don't want the water running down the path you want it to drain off to the side of the path to the point that you might actually even do something like like that. Uh, now, in real life, you might do something like that. That's way too complicated for this sort of vignette. But what you're doing there is you're making it so you're picking up these little ditches on either side of the walkway so that no water cuts across the walk. You're trying to keep the walkway as dry as possible. So just a little information there. So we've got the pad 
the sort of extended area here. We've got uh, all these swoopy lines that bring us to sort of force that water to sort of go around the site, uh, around where we're worried about it. And we haven't touched anything that's too close to where the trees or any of the property lines. You want to make sure that by accident you don't just somehow uh, accidentally do something where you're changing something over that property line because you don't own that property line. You can't cut into their property. Um, so you have to be careful about that kind of thing. Um, you want to make sure you don't get into where the tree line is, the drip line it's referred to as. If the, the assumption is that the, how far the trees branch out is equal up in the air as it is how uh, far the roots branch out down below. So you don't want to cut the roots, so you don't want to cut any land underneath that drip line of the tree. Um, now, in the real world, you generally do these things in these sort of swoopy lines that I've shown. Um, but just to be clear, when you do these things uh, on the actual vignette program, each of these contour lines will look kind of like this. There'll be a, a, a little button, be another button, there'll be another button, and you can actually put in buttons as you go along. Um, so you, if you wanted to make one of these nice swoopy lines here, what you would do is you would probably put a button in right there, and then maybe another button right there, and then you'd grab this button and you'd pull it out, and then you'd make this thing go whoop, like that. So instead of looking swoopy like I've drawn it, which is how most people would physically draw it, um, it's these little triangles you'd see, and then this line would go away. Both of these would uh, go away. And that button would now be right up there. Right? So in actuality, yours will look more like, like that. Um, so you can see this is this super complicated, you've got storm water, you've got accessibility, you've got to get the construction pad to work, there's all these different things going on, you can't touch the trees, you can't touch the parking lot, there's all these different issues. Eh, you can do it in, you should be able to do this in eight minutes. Uh, it's really simple and straightforward once you've practiced it a few times. Any good, uh, any good tips? Um, so this is the one I failed a million years ago um, because I didn't put the little swoops in the right direction. Yeah, this Jacqueline is, asks a great question. This is, how do you know? Is there, any, is there any good like rule of thumb or good way to remember? So, I, you know, this is always tricky. Um, and it's better when I'm in person, you can see me waving my hands around. Um, but if you, if you imagine, okay, imagine we have some soil on a slope. And then if we did a contour line across it, you know, it's just a straight line going across, mm -hmm. right? All right, now let's imagine that we dug a hole, right? And it was this uh, thing, right? Well, that contour line now comes and does that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's pointing uphill. So note these are pointing uphill. The ditches are pointing uphill. The berms or mounds are pointing downhill. People have a hard time with that. Find the system that you feel comfortable with. The way that I do it, and this cracks people up all the time, is I just wave my hands around and in the air, I draw what I just drew right there. If I get confused, I just make a slope with my hands Imagine I'm digging it out and then draw the contour line and it's obvious. It becomes super clear. The hard part is you look like an idiot. So you yeah. just have to get over that. Um, so you're in this exam. The person next to you taking the exam, they're taking an exam for like beautician or becoming a detective or something. So don't worry about it. They don't, they'll, you'll never see that person again. It's okay if you look like an idiot while you're taking the exam. Just make sure you feel comfortable going in the right direction. <laughs> Plus, as you said earlier, you're standing, you're sitting there with no clothes yeah, on. Yeah, you're already naked, so, so who cares? What's the big difference? Right. 
<clears throat> All right, good stuff. Well, thanks, Mike. Um, that was really good. Uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in. We had a ton of questions. Um, sorry we were unable to get to all of them, but um, some really good questions there. Um, if you'd like to attend our next ARE Live broadcast where we're going to have a discussion with some recently licensed architects who are parents um, and who've gotten it done uh, while wrestling a bunch of children, um, uh, you can go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. For those of you who are on the live webinar here, I actually posted the registration link in the chat box so you can use that. Just like today, you'll have a chance to ask questions uh, to all the participants in our discussion. Uh, to learn more about our, I should mention, I mean, a lot of what Mike just did, it was sort of a high level summary of what we did in our entire ARE4 curriculum, which is available on blackspectacles.com. Uh, Mike goes into every single one of the vignettes for ARE4.0. Um, he also reviews the sample problems that are a part of the downloaded software. So it's a really good resource. Um, again, you can, you can go to blackspectacles.com to check out some of the free course videos. Um, and as I always say, if you'd like your boss to pay for that, make sure you go to blackspectacles.com slash firms to learn more about those firm memberships. Can I just say, mm -hmm. getting your boss to pay for it sure makes life a lot better. Yeah, yeah. They pay for all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, for those of you who are ready to do that um, and, uh, and your boss isn't going to be ponying up the money, or even if they are, um, we're, uh, we offer a 15% discount uh, for the entire duration of your ARE exam prep membership with today's coupon code, which is VIGNT13018 YT. That's worth 15% off the entire duration of your ARE exam prep membership, ARE 4 or 5. Um, and then lastly, uh, tomorrow we'll send you an email uh, follow up about today's live broadcast. So please let us know what you think and share any suggestions you uh, might have. Uh, we read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching.